Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. We're going to study the book of Romans, and this series will go through verse by verse, expository teaching of the Word of God. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separate unto the gospel of God. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all that we have and enjoy. Father, we pray now that we learn from your word, and we thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That's the apostle's favorite terminology for himself, as the apostles were ministers and servants to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the body of Jesus Christ for their edification. What is a servant? A servant, a person, male or female, that attends another for the purpose of performing menial offices for them or who is employed by another for such offices or for other labor and is subject to his command. The word is correlative to master. Servants different from slaves as servants objection to a master is voluntary. The slave is not. Every slave is a servant, but every servant is not a slave. So as Christians, we're called to voluntarily serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a free will service. God is looking for those folks that will serve him out of love as sons. We're instructed, and this goes to all the servants of the Lord, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. So remember what we taught this morning that the Lord said, take my yoke, I am lowly and meek. And meekness and lowliness are the daughters of humility. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose himself. If God preeventure will give them repentance, the acknowledging of the truth. And that's what we have to teach people and proclaim in the gospel. Again, because of Hollywood, because of the great falling away, a large number of Christians are going to emotion rather than truth. And I was uh, quite surprised to see the certain minister take a stand of remorse that in the past they had done too much with emotions and rather than bringing the gospel, the, the truth of the gospel to people. And truth has to come before emotions. It's fact, faith, and then your feelings. Uh, if you're doing wrong, God doesn't really care how you feel about it. You're supposed to do right. And it doesn't really matter how you feel about it. It's doing right. And in time, you'll learn to feel good about doing right if you're a true servant of God. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preventure give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And repentance is key to salvation. That comes before. It's faith that saves us when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But without true repentance, there's really no need for true faith. You have to see yourself as a sinner condemned to hell in need of salvation, and you have to turn from your own self-righteousness, your own self, or the world, or whatever you're trusting in, to God. And then you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therein is your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And of course, this culture is um, strongly captive by Satan. Servants are of various kinds, as householder domestic servants, menial servants, laborers who are hired by the day, week, or other term, and do not reside with their employers, or if they board in the same house, are employed abroad and not in domestic services, apprentices who are bound for a term of years to serve a master for the purpose of learning his trade or occupation. And so our society moves on and so many people are servants or in the position of servitude in their employment that but but they don't think so they're, they're above that 
they, they're filled with pride and they just, I'm not a servant. Well, then if you're not a servant, you're not worthy of, his lab, of your labor. The labor is worthy of his hire. And he's doing his master's bidding and, that's, and he does it voluntarily and he hires himself out. And it's called character. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ, and that's servants, and stewards of the mysteries of God. So it is that a minister is to minister the truths and the doctrines and the messages of God. First, in our time and age, the preaching of the gospel, the declaration of the gospel of salvation by grace, you must be born again. And then in living for Christ and then glorifying God. There's three basic things for the church and for the minister and for the servants. And that is to preach Christ crucified, uh, to teach Christ for living, and to glorify God for both. Real simple. And the, and the church is missing it. They've gone to entertainment and music. And uh, there's nothing wrong with these things as long as they're put in their place. And Christ has the preeminence. And that's what's missing today. Christ having the preeminence. And I will take you to a lot of service today. They'll get all excited over the music. But when it comes to preaching or teaching the word of God, I mean, they'll hear a song. Song won't even be a good song. It'll have a nice melody or a nice tune to it. And it'll be an arbitrary, ambiguous song. And um, you don't even really know if they're singing to the Lord or to the devil. And uh, they'll go crazy over that. They'll get all emotional. Praise God and hallelujah. And then when the preaching occurs, it's dead. It's dead as a doornail. And I'm sorry. You don't have to be dead if it's just teaching. I mean, somebody ought to be listening to truths of God's words. Amen, preacher. That's... We want, tell us the truth. Tell it like it is. Give, us to, give it us the truth. The truth should make you free. I preached this message on the, on, the, uh, on the mysteries of God. And you won't remember it, but there's a young man that came here who was very upset. And I'll tell you why he was upset. Because he's predisposed to all this emotion. He'll take a verse and have a fit. And I taught that the minister is responsible to God to teach the, the mysteries. And I went through the mysteries in a message. And he thinks I'm the devil. <laughs> he thinks I'm the problem. Because he's got emotions. Hey, everybody's got them. Good ones and bad ones. It's no big deal that you've got emotion. If I let my emotions take charge of me, I wouldn't be in the ministry today. It's truth that keeps you going. It's truth that causes you to witness. It's truth that leads a man to serve God in spirit and truth. In a legal sense, stewards, factors, bailiffs, and other agents are servants. For the time they are employed in such character as they act in subordination to others. One in a state of subjection, a person who voluntarily serves another or acts as his minister, as Joshua was the servant of Moses, and the apostles the uh, servants of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ calls himself a servant, as in Old Testament scriptures called him a servant. Now, for whether is greater, he that sitteth at me, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at me, but I am among you as he that serveth. Let's think about that. In the divine nature. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Creator of the universe. By him all things were made. And there's not anything that's made that was made that he didn't make it. And now he's walking the earth as a servant. And a servant of servants is one debased to the lowest condition of servitude. You know the apostle Paul liked to call himself a servant. He said for I am the least of the apostles. That's lowliness. That's humility. That I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, for Paul, the persecution was in blindness and ignorance. What should we say of Christians that harm the body of Christ and persecute the church through vain, 
pride and glory. Vain glory. Blindness. The book of Romans has 16 chapters, 433 uh, verses, 9,477 words. The date on the book's writing is about 58 B.C. Now you understand you're not going to be able to uh, date any of these books absolutely. Paul had to write the book of Romans, you can figure it out, before he came to Rome. So if you read the book of Acts, and you'll see that he went to Rome in Acts 25. So he had to write the book before then because the book is written to the Romans. And he uh, wasn't in Rome yet. And when he got to Rome, that's where he stayed. So he had to write the book sometime in the latter part of Acts, most likely around chapter 21 or 22. And this is why most scholars date the book around 58 A.D. What's the message? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. And we have, um, I remember it was a song when I was growing up. We have the Executive Car Wash Blues here in America. And that is uh, somebody that's a car wash intendant. They believe they should be running the country. The country doesn't understand the gifts and intellect that they have. In uh, Vietnam, uh, they used to have uh, inexperienced officers. It was a grave mistake they made. And they would send these guys through um, school and then send them to lead troops in the field uh, without experience. And that was bad. That cost a lot of lives. And it wasn't that the individuals themselves were bad, that lacking experience, they didn't know what they were doing. They did stupid things. And that's what's not appreciated today, is experience. If you'll look and go back through history, you'll find, to the most part, the older men that were presidents had much better presidencies than younger men due to experience due to the wisdom gained through life's experiences. But experience isn't appreciated today because everybody's got themselves a college education. And a college education doesn't give you much of any experience. It just gives you a whole bunch of facts that may or may not apply. Now, the telephone company spent over $150,000 on educating me and gave me the education of an engineer. And out of that entire education, when I started to do my occupation, about 10% of it applied. And here's the thing that you, that you need to understand. I was being educated totally in the computers. I wasn't being, my education was not in reading, writing, arithmetic, as you go to a college and get a general education in these in, in fields and other uh, factors that you're not even going to be doing in your educated field. So you get very little education to what you actually are going to apply yourself to after you come out. And no experience. Experience is of intestinal value. Most American Christians today are seeking a God that will serve them rather than the true and living God to serve. Whereas every pastor, elder, bishop, missionary, evangelist is a servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. It took 34 years of patience to see these buildings come into existence in order for a church to meet in it. And of course, those that have never had the patience to witness and pray and, and, and bring people to church, at the same time building buildings and meeting the responsibility and needs of the family, think they know how to do it better than those that have done it. And with their charisma, they impress people to their own folly. Amen. 
As a matter of fact, the Bible calls every Christian to be a servant of the Lord and not a Lord. Now, for he that is called is the Lord's, being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Here's an interesting, I was telling you about this. This is your mentality, your Christians today. I declare that this will be a miracle weekend for you. <laughs> Let's create a miracle weekend. Chain on. Type miracle below and then click share. That's a moron. That's a fool. That's, a, that's an individual filled with themselves. I declare, that's God. Are you God? They must think they are. I declare. Sounds like I will be like the most high. A miracle weekend for you. <laughs> Reminds me of a song, A Dream Vacation. How do, you create a, how do you create a miracle weekend? I thought a miracle was an intervention of God beyond human um, um, uh, interference. Type miracle below. Only believe. You've got to believe. Do you believe in foolishness? That's what kept me from getting saved. Back, back when I was young and, and I was trying to, searching to find out what faith was. People said, oh, you've got to believe. I had these nutcases. you just got to believe. I called it grunting faith. <laughs> Well, that's what they're at. You just got to believe. Well, what happens when what you believe in doesn't come true? Now, I found out what real faith was. I believe in the revelation of God, of his son, through the scriptures. And I put my trust and faith in Christ. And I believe that every word of God is pure. And I believe that God is able and I believe that I have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Amen. Here's what I believe in. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, that power, that's the power to live. And to live godly and holy and righteously and true. That's the power of a faith that few people have because everybody thinks they got to cheat to get ahead. That's what the devil has convinced people. And I'm telling you that if you play by the rule book, God's, not the world's, and follow the Lord, he will bless you and get you through. You'll have food and raiment and you won't have to fear when all hell breaks loose and everything collapses. It is not a miracle that we need, but God's grace in our trials and temptations and the power of a holy life in the face of injustice and iniquity. Again, I don't know who that poor soul was, that young girl, 26 years old. What a travesty of justice. That thing's been going on for a number of years. To be raped and defend yourself and then executed for defending yourself against a rapist assailant. That's a war on women. And you talk about, uh, and make sure this is on there for some lost fool. Uh, you got this war on women because somebody doesn't want to, I don't want to pay for somebody's, some female's contraceptives. <laughs> You're nuts. You're crazy, crazy, crazy people. Be a virgin. You don't need contraceptives. Amen. Have some character. Separate on the gospel of God, the Christian life is more than being separated from sin in the world. It's to be separated unto God. Amen. Which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, I'm here to tell you, the other writings, 
and especially that atrocity in the Middle East that we're placating and, and bowing down to, called Islam, that murders young women, that abuses people, misuses people, slaughters people, is not holy. We got a holy Bible and a holy God, and he's harmless. Holy, to be properly whole, entire or perfect in a moral sense, hence pure in heart, temper or disposition, free from sin and sinful affections. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Sure, they had sin in their life, but most of their life was holy. It was dedicated to God. And when you see the sin revealed in the life of some of God's servants, oh, they always pick on um, the fellow that pulled the temple down, Samson. Well, if you check it out, Samson had 20 years that he served God in. Probably as a normal Jewish servant. And he got ahead of time in his life, he entered in sin. David was a great king for the majority of his life. And God judged him for his sin with Bathsheba. And Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for all have sinned in Noah, but most of their lives, these men lived not like most other men. They lived holy to God. That's what God asks of you if you're gonna be his servant. He wants you to live a holy life. A holy life is a good life, it's a right life, it's a true life, it's a just life, and it's a life that God will bless and have fellowship with. Applied to supreme being, holy signifies perfectly pure, immaculate, and complete in moral character and righteousness. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded this covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Man is more or less holy as his heart is more or less sanctified or purified from evil dispositions. We call a man holy when his heart is conformed in some degree to the image of God and his life is regulated by divine precepts of the divine nature of God. Hence, holy is used nearly synonymous with good, pious, and godly. And yes, God expects us to be holy because it is written, be holy for I am holy. God wants us to be like him. That which is holy is hollow, consecrated, or set apart to sacred use, or to service or worship of God as a holy priesthood and holy men of God. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. The holy scriptures will be found in the truth as they come to man by holy men of God that were moved by the Holy Spirit through the spirit of holiness are we able to be sanctified unto the truth? And that was the Lord's prayer for us, his folks. Sanctify them through thy truth. See, not emotions, not affections. See, if you get the truth, then you can have good emotions and good affections. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It goes up into the brain, down into the heart. When it comes out of the heart, through the mouth, that's when all the evil comes out. It's supposed to go into the brain, down to the heart. Son, give me the heart, and then come out of the mouth holy. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them unto the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So it's the truth that sets you apart. That builds character in itself. And this is the thing you would hear people always preaching and talking about is stand alone. Well, when you get the opportunity to be one man in God, you're going to take it. God will check your character out. So that's easy to say when there's a lot of people around to back you up. 
But what are you going to be like when there's nobody around? Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's the truth of the holy child, Jesus. The lineage of Jesus Christ is traced back through Mary as Jesus Christ was the son of God. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph. He was not Joseph's son, which was the son of Heli. But it was through Mary's lineage that he's of David. For he was made of the woman. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now that's the best proof you'll ever have of being born again and a saved Christian. You ought to be able to cry in your soul to the Father, Daddy, Daddy, Dad. And that woman was made from David's seed and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The reason death could not keep him was because he was sinless. That's the power. He was sinless and that gave him the power of the resurrection. Paul wanted to know that that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Well, it comes through sinlessness. If he'd been a sinner, he'd never had the power to resurrect. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Today, I declare a miracle. Something wonderful is going to happen to you. That wasn't what Paul was looking for. He wanted to take fellowship in his sufferings. He wanted to know what Christ suffered. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Until you suffer some things, one of the first sufferings in my life, and a lot of you have suffered it, is the loss of a close relative or friend. My dad, my father, died when I was 16. It was shocking. It, it, it gave me this awful hurt and emptiness. I was lost, and he was lost. And death is awful to a lost man without any hope. But what I learned from that was to see others in the same situation, have compassion for them, and to act appropriately when others were suffering. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered complete and total rejection of all his disciples and absolute betrayal of one of them, the one that was most trusted, that was given the money. And then he was humiliated before them after they had forsaken him. All the pictures of crucifixions with him dressed or covered are false. They're done for modesty. He was stripped completely naked in front of all the people jeering at him. The agony of the soul must have been tremendous. To be the creator and the savior and the holy, harmless son of God. He hurt no one. Raised the sick, healed the dead, fed them, loved them, and they abused him. He that departed from evil, making himself a prey. They preyed upon him. I don't know if you've ever seen the savagery of animals when they prey. Paul wanted to know this. Paul got to know it. In a humanistic way, beaten and shipwrecked, abused and rejected, the greatest minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ that history in the Bible portrays is the Apostle Paul, and he died alone, looking for a coat to keep him warm because winter was coming. 
he got to know his Savior in some manner. The power of an endless life, the supreme power of all power. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, lowly and meek and humble. The Father loved the Son, because the Son was lowly, meek, and humble, and would lay his life down, that I might take it again. Because he was sinless, he could take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. And so you have that song. He could have called 10,000 angels. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received in my Father. Now, you have to face the obvious truth. Such a man as this, to say what he's saying, is either God incarnate or a madman. For me, I know whom I have believed in. I've found the true and living God, Christ Jesus. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Obedience to the faith is to place your faith in the gospel. Again, what's the gospel? Paul declared it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. I probably should have brought one of those pictures of the Jesus they put on the website all the time doesn't look like Jesus would have looked there's nothing close to the biblical descriptions of him Peter also declared the gospel Acts 15 7 and when there had been much disputing Peter rose up and said of them men and brethren you know how that a good while ago God made choice amongst us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, pure, watch it, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. We should be saved even as they. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit calls men and women through the foolishness of preaching. That's how the Spirit works. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now the problem you have today are people are so internally devoid of the knowledge of the things of God and so filled with sins that when they come to a church and they hear preaching, they can't handle it. They think somebody's persecuting them rather than revealing the truth to them. I don't know how to get by that today to tell folks, hey, God loves you. He wants to save you, but you've got to come to the truth of yourself in order for you to know you need a savior. The gifts and calling of God are about repentance. That's something that you need to make sure you understand as a Christian because the devil's going to try to get you to doubt your salvation when you've truly been saved. Now, when God saves you one more time, he saves you from your sins, your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. And when he saved you, all your sins were future. And the gift is the gift of life. And the calling of God are out repentance. 
You're dealing with a God that has better character than any of us. When he gives his word, it sticks. It doesn't matter how we, much we fail. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why if you're truly born again in the spirit, you can cry, Abba, Father, Dad, Daddy. And you're beloved of God. Now, this is important. You need this because God wants you to be a servant. God wants you to serve him out of love. Ephesians 1.3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Accordingly as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. There it is. Holy and without blame before him in love. That's godly love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Now you've got a lot of brethren today, and good men. In fact, there's a pastor friend of mine. I'm sending him an email because he's been teaching some really good stuff. But he believes in error, and it's in his humanity. And it has a propensity to be just, but it's not, it doesn't apply into the, in, in our time when we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, the cutting off of our flesh and our separating our soul and it being um, sealed. And where they come with is, if you, if you commit some sin that they just don't think is acceptable, then you never were truly saved or born again. That's false. Because once daddy becomes your daddy, he's your daddy. Dads don't throw away their sons. In whom we have redemption through his blood. He shed his blood for you. The forgiveness of sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. Now faith abound much more in the scriptures in the New Testament than it does in the Old Testament. In fact, if you study the Bible, you'll find faith is only found two places in the Old Testament. 300 places in the New Testament. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now this comes into something that even uh, some good men, I have a different faith in what they perceive. You see, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken throughout the whole world. And here he goes to limit God says, well, you know, that's kind of a metaphor because uh, we don't have any evidence that um, the gospel got over here to the Indians and to everybody else. Well, I think we do. What do you believe about what you do not know? See, that's what faith is, believing what God said about something you don't know. It would appear that before Paul went to Rome, the Lord had sent disciples to the end of the known world. Yes, it could be a metaphor for those in his sphere of influence, but other scriptures reveal God has his servants. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words on the end of the world. I don't know, but by going what God says twice, this is what I believe. I believe that after the crucifixion and after the empowering at Pentecost, that the followers of the Lord, God sent them to the known world. And I don't know how far at that time, uh, at about what, um, 
30 AD or 35 AD, 38 AD, somewhere in that time period. The Lord empowered the disciples and the apostles and sent them into the world with the gospel. I believe within three years of that time, they had walked across the Bering Strait, if that's what was necessary, or took a little boat and brought the gospel to the whole world. What you need to realize is this. Man has a propensity of rejecting God and running from him. And God is not responsible to redeem men, though he goes the extra mile and goes after them. And he will not save you if you will not be saved. Faith is the belief, the ascent of the mind to the truth of what is declared by another, resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence, the judgment that what another states or testifies is truth. So you always get, well, what about the heathen that hasn't heard? I believe the heathen heard within three years. If they didn't hear within three years, they heard by 58 AD when Paul was writing. writing. God gets things done by secret disciples that you and I never even realize. That's the vanity of man. Well, it couldn't have happened. I didn't go, so it couldn't have happened. <laughs> Somebody that had better character than you, loved the Lord stronger than you, was willing to sacrifice more than you, went and got the job done. And you're going to find that out at the judgment seat of Christ, and you're going to be ashamed of yourself. I have strong faith or no faith in the testimony of a witness or in what a historian narrates. The ascent of the mind to the truth of a proposition advanced by another, belief or probable evidence of any kind. That's what faith is. So what's the Bible say? One verse before. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In theology, it is the ascent of the mind or understanding to the truth of what God has revealed. Simple belief of the scriptures of the being and perfections of God, of the existence, character, and doctrines of Jesus Christ, founded on the testimony of the sacred writers, is called historical or speculative faith, a faith little distinguished from the belief of existence and achievements of Alexander or Caesar. But Hebrews tells you this. Let's get even more biblical. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Stop calling God a liar. God will save you. Start believing what God said. And God will teach you and guide you. Evangelical or justifying or saving faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of divine revelation. On the authority of God's testimony. God said it, that settles it. That's kind of vain. I've said it myself. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. it you're believing it's irrelevant. God said it, that settles it. It's good for you to believe it. God doesn't need you to believe it. You need to believe it. Amen. Accompanied with a cordial assent of the will or appropriation of the heart. There's your emotions. Now put your affections on him. Now bring your emotions out. Once you got the truth. An entire confidence or trust in God's character and declarations and in the character and doctrines of Jesus Christ with an unreserved surrender to the, uh, to the will of his guidance and dependence on his merits for salvation. In other words, that firm belief of God's testimony of the truth of the gospel which influences uh, the will and leads to an entire reliance on Jesus Christ for salvation. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants you to put your faith in him, his son, and trust him and believe him, the revelation of the word. Saving faith stops calling God a liar and begins to trust and obey his revelation. They don't sing it anymore. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. 
Sing that. We all sing that one. We got that in our songbook? I like that. That's a good song. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Saving faith stops calling God a liar and begins to trust and obey his revelation. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't know. I will not know until I'm before the throne. If early disciples ventured forth out of Jerusalem to the ends of man's running from God to the Bering Strait, to Africa, to India. But I believe God sent his disciples. The Bible implies it. And by faith, I believe God. And I believe he did it rather quickly. Someday I'll know for sure. I don't know about heaven. I've never been there. I've never seen heaven. But God told me about it. And I believe God. And so I'm looking to find out more about it when I get there. But I know about the streets of gold. And I know about the mansions. And I know about the most important thing of all in heaven is the presence of God. And the absence of all the misery of this life. Joy unspeakable. We are confident, I say, and willing rather be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now that's what you should be concerned about in your life, is being accepted of him. And it's easy to be accepted one that's lowly and meek. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Paul said, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. That's very important. He, he served with his spirit. You have a spirit in you. You have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Before you got saved, sin slew your spirit, and your spirit was dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. And that's what the new birth is, is when you're born again, God regenerates your spirit and brings it to life. Paul talks about that dead spirit. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That spirit in him was dead through sin. And the same for us, for as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. That's what a true new birth is, is when you get a living spirit. So those that are born again should reckon themselves alive to God. Now, I'll, I'll show you what to look for. This is the revelation of a, of a new birth of a living spirit. Likewise, reckon, yourselves, reckon ye also yourselves be dead. That's your flesh, your old man, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is it? You see over there, the senses, faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We've been teaching a lot about faith. Hope, hope maketh not a shame. I like that song. I am going to a city where the roses always bloom. Reverence, God is to be reverent because he's holy and reverent is his name. Prayer, praying to God is your father. Abba, father. Worship, worshiping in spirit and truth. Those are the sex, senses and faculties of the spirit. A spirit that's been born again, made alive. If you've never been born again, then you have a worldly faith, a worldly hope, a worldly reverence, and a worldly prayer, and a worldly worship at best, and it all perishes with the world. And it's probably worse than that because your soul your natural man has affections that are jaded, reasoning that's defective, memory that's wanting, a conscience that's been seared, and imaginations that are dark and dank because of the impressions that have come through your carnal creature, 
through your sight and your smell and your hearing and your taste and your touch. We'll pick up next week in the book of Romans. Romans chapter, uh, chapter 1. Let's close a word of prayer. Are there any questions? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.